John chapter 18 tonight, picking right up where we left off last week, and we'll start reading in verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, where was a garden into which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oftentimes resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and saith unto him, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he, and Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon as he had uh, said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, uh, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spake of them which thou gavest me. Have I lost none? So right there we see the story of where the betrayal happens. It, it finally happens. We knew it was coming. Uh, last week uh, we looked at the prayer. The whole chapter is pretty much a, uh, Jesus just praying in the garden. And that goes right along with the story we see in the other Gospels where Jesus would go, uh, he would go off to pray by himself and he would tell the disciples, watch him pray. And it mentioned in some of the other Gospels that he was exceeding sorrowful unto death. It mentions how he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. And after he says this, I mean, just tremendous prayer, you know, praying for his disciples, praying for us, immediately after this prayer, he is greeted by a bunch of soldiers being led by one of his disciples, being betrayed. And, you know, I believe that even though Jesus uh, always knew that Judas was a devil, and even though he always knew Judas was going to betray him, I believe Jesus loved Judas, and I believe the betrayal hurt him. And we see that too. It doesn't mention it here in this gospel, but um, whenever Judas kissed Jesus, he says, you know, betray us on me with a kiss. You know, that, that's, how, that's how you're going to do this. And I, I think it, it hurt a little bit uh, because Jesus loved Judas and of course had done nothing to deserve what had just happened. But uh, we see here in the story though, of course, as Jesus is getting ready to be taken, I love that how he says, I am he, and they all fall down. I mean, just imagine too. And this reminds me of, you know, police today. Have you ever noticed how whenever there's like, you know, there'll be like one, they'll, they'll pull one person over and they'll have like four cars out there, you know, for that one person. And it's like, you know, what in the world did they do? It's like, even, they even think there's a possibility of something major, you know, they'll, they'll you know, they always got to have a ton of backup and it's just ridiculous the way you see that. And here they're going, they're trying to get, you know, get, catch one man and I understand he had some disciples too but you know they've got this huge band of soldiers coming to get this one man who's never done anything violent I mean never been a hint of violence from Jesus from any of his disciples I mean zero reason to be concerned and yet they do they bring this big band of soldiers and I don't know that just tells me you know you're in the wrong when you're doing that, you know, and whenever I see cops doing that too, I don't know, I just, it bothers me. It's like, you know, whatever happened to Andy Griffith, you know, Sheriff Andy or Andy Taylor, you know, who could show up and just handle things on his own, didn't need no backup, didn't even need a gun, you know, and he always got the job done, but that's because he was a good sheriff, you know, these ones, these guys were bad. They were the bad guys and they always need more. They always need more. And so uh, they, but the, Jesus says, I am he, and they all go falling down. Now, this clearly is a miracle, okay? Pe Jesus talked to people all the time, and they didn't go falling down. You know, what was happening here, okay? Was this a charismatic experience like Benny Hinn or somebody when they, you know, say something or breathe and everybody goes falling backwards? No, he's not slaying these people in the spirit here. But, you know, I think there's three reasons that he made them all fall backwards. I think, first of all, the, probably the most obvious one is he was just letting them all know who's boss and just... Real clear, here they go, trying to flex their muscles, show their might, coming marching up in formation. Where's Jesus of Nazareth? I am he. Boom, they all go fall, they all go falling down. I'll show you who's boss. I think another reason was to prove that he went to the cross willingly. See, and this is a key thing to understand too. You know, Jesus was executed. You know, he died a horrible death, but it was willingly. 
He could have stopped it at any time. Nothing was done outside of his control. And that's something that we need to, we need to think about too because there's been many who have suffered horrible deaths and horrible punishments. There's been many who have been tortured. Uh, but you know what? Jesus went through all that having the power to stop it. You know, I don't know how much I could handle if I, you know, I had no power to stop it. If I had the power to stop it at the snap of a finger, you know, probably wouldn't take much for me to, for me to snap that finger. But Jesus, he, he, I think he's just showing them, I'm going because I want to go. I just knocked all of you down with the word of my mouth, but I'm going to go along with you anyway. Uh, I believe another reason too that he made them all fall down. If you notice in verse nine, it says that the saying might be fulfilled. Uh, or in verse eight, Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spake of them, which thou gavest me, I have lost none. Jesus, he, uh, I think he was trying to protect his disciples. I think maybe he tried to put a little bit of a spook in them, you know, knowing that they were ordered only to round up the disciples, but maybe thought, you know, knowing these Roman soldiers, they were probably dumb. They were probably, uh, you know, might get a little overzealous. And think, you know what, let's, let's arrest all the disciples too. He went easy. Let's go ahead and take his disciples in too. But so Jesus, he does this to intimidate them a little bit. That way, when he's like, take me, I'm the one you're looking for, leave them alone, they would be like, well, you know what, we were only ordered to come get him. Yeah, let's do what he says. And so I think he did that. Uh, I think part of that was protection for his disciples. So look at verse 10. It says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. And the servant's name was Malchus. And Je- then Jesus said unto Peter, Put up the sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I drink it? And this is an amazing statement he makes here. But before that, I show you what's amazing about this statement or what jumps out to me when I, when I read that is first of all, you know, notice how Peter, you know, grabs a sword. Remember, Peter was the one who, when he first heard Jesus was going to die, you know, he's like, no, that's not how it's going to be. You know, he, you know, Peter, he often ran his mouth about being willing to fight for Jesus. And you know what? I think we can say Peter kind of backed it up here, didn't he? You know, whenever they went to take him, all of a sudden he saw an opening and I believe he went to go take the guy's head off. And the guy kind of did one of these numbers and got his ear. You know, and uh, of course, Jesus went and healed that servant's ear. Once again, I think to protect Peter. Because you know what? You know, cutting off the guy's ear, that's going to get him in trouble with the law. But Jesus, he goes and heals that guy's ear. Well, you don't want to go telling that to, you know, you don't want to go accusing these terrible, evil Jesus and his disciples They cut my ear off. Well, your ears looks pretty good to me. Well, that's because Jesus healed it. So then why is he a bad guy? (laughs) You know, so, uh, you know, that that shut them up about that right there. You know, Peter's kind of committed a crime, you could say right there. And but yet Jesus, he kind of fixed all that, you know, protecting Peter. But then so he tell he tells Peter, though, you know, put up thy sword in the sheath, the cup which my father hath given me. Shall I not drink it? Now, could anybody think of someone who said something very similar to that in the Old Testament? He didn't use those exact words, but uh, the the words, the I think the sentiment is very similar. If you go back in Job chapter two, okay, after Job, you know, he's lost everything. Job, after, you know, God has even allowed the devil to smite his body with these boils. Job's wife is trying to get him to just curse God and die. And it says in Job 2, 10, but he said unto her, thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of the Lord? And shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job send with his lips. Job uh, recognized the fact that that what he was about or what he had partaken of was evil. It was bad, but it was of God. And he's like, why would we not take it? Why would we not allow ourselves to partake in what is the will of God? And y'all realize that 
Job said that before he had Jesus as an example. You know, there's many, many times I've heard people, you know, where they will quote, they're going through a really difficult time. And what do they do? They claim scripture. And you know what? That's good. That's appropriate. That shows that you have faith. But you know, what if you didn't have that scripture? You know, you know, how many times have we been going through something and we, you know, we, we didn't understand why we were facing what we were facing. And so what do we do? Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good. Them who love God, them who are called according to his purpose. We say that all the time when we don't understand what's going on, but we're able to say that because we have that verse. People like Job said things like that before he had that. You know, it's one thing for us to say, shall we not receive good at the, uh, evil at the, or good at the hand of the Lord and not evil also? Because we have Job as an example. And we do, we see, we see examples in the Bible like that. You know, guys like Abraham who had faith before all the big examples that we have today. You know, guys like David, remember the story? I, I preached the message a while back and I kind of showed the examples of David when he took the persecution from that relative of Saul and he just, he just took it and was humble. And I believe it reminded God of himself at what he was going to do someday in the future. David took that kind of treatment that he didn't deserve before Jesus ever did. And that's why God calls him a man after his own heart. And so when I hear Jesus say this, something that's so similar to what Job said, the exact same attitude, I've got to be impressed with Job. And then it makes you say, you know what? I understand why there's a whole book devoted to a guy named Job. I kind of understand a little bit while, you know, God would use him as an example. You know, the, uh, you've heard of the patience of Job in the Old Testament. You know, Noah, Daniel and Job were there. You know, he's his name is often mentioned. Why? Because he's another guy that's just a lot like Jesus Christ. And so, boy, you know, it's one thing when we do the right thing, you know, because we've got all these examples in the Bible. You know, we have Jesus Christ. We have his example, but we ought to, our minds ought to be blown by the people we read about in the Old Testament who did all the right things they did when they didn't have the New Testament like we do today. And that's why, too, you got these people, they will, you know, who'll make some of the same mistakes that maybe guys like David or Abraham did, and then they'll try to put themselves in the same category as David and Abraham. Sorry. You know, they did it before they had the completed scriptures like you. They did it before they had the stories of the consequences. You know, we should have you know, been smart enough to learn from their examples. And so, listen, God expects a lot more from us than he did from them. And so when we see those guys back in the Old Testament acting like Jesus before Jesus did what Jesus did, we ought to be blown away by that. We ought to be humbled and we ought to be shamed by that. And we have, we have no excuse for not doing the right things, not having the right attitude. And so I, when, I, you know, when I read that, I thought back about that, about Job and what he had said. And just had that same attitude. You know what? This is, this is of God. This is God's will. Therefore, you know what? We're going we're gonna to accept it. And we're going to take it gladly. Jesus told Peter, they that take the sword will perish with the sword. You know why? Because it wasn't, you know, it wasn't God's will for them, him, him to fight. It was God's will for Jesus to go through the cross. Uh, look at verse 12. So, so then, um, then, the band, uh, then the band and the captain and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the place of the high priest. So Jesus, he gets taken to go through a trial here where a decision has basically already been made. You know, you've got Annas and uh, Caiaphas, who are related to each other. So, you know, you know they're going to be in cahoots with each other. You know they're going to work together. You know, Caiaphas has come up with this, you know, bright idea of once a year having someone die for the people. You know, 
where did they get? They didn't get that from the Old Testament law, did they? You know, that was something he, you know, he came up with. Something that was wicked. Something he had no place doing. And so, of course, he's going to want someone to die for the people. And he's going to want it to be Jesus. Because he, you know, here he is, the high priest. And you've got Jesus who's, you know, people are following him. You know, instead of, you know, the scribes and the Pharisees and, you know, the religious establishment. And so, yeah, he's going to have a huge problem with Jesus. I mean, he didn't have a chance in this trial. There's, there's not a chance. And so, you know, he, it, notice how it mentions in verse uh, um, 15, it says, And Simon Peter followed Jesus. And then one of the other Gospels, it says that he followed afar off. Okay? So as they go, Peter's following afar off. But it says, And so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. And it's interesting, his name is not mentioned, but does anybody know who it probably is? It's probably John. And we see John sometimes who he'll be referenced in the book of John as he, that he is writing. And he doesn't, he, it's like he doesn't like to talk about himself. You know, and he'll mention sometimes that it's him, but uh, you know, he... He wasn't, I don't know, it was like he wasn't trying to make it about himself. But he did. He went with Jesus, and he was also the one we'll see later uh, when, uh, next week who was at the cross with Jesus. The only one. And so, um, you know, Peter, though, he, or, you know, he's, he ends up, we, we're going to see here in these next verses, he ends up denying Christ basically to save his own skin. Look at verse 16. It says, but Peter stood at the door without, then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, art not thou also one of this man's disciples? So John goes and tells this girl, hey, let him in. And so Peter comes in, kind of with John, who is clearly with Jesus, and this girl gets suspicious. You know, are you, art thou not also not... Uh, one of this man's disciples, he saith, I am not. And the servants and the officers stood there who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warned himself. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. So uh, we'll stop reading there for a second. So, you know, even though Peter had told, you know, clearly told Jesus that he would die, or, you know, even though Jesus had told Peter that he was going to die, Peter never accepted that truth. Okay? It was told to them multiple times that he was going to die, but it always went right over the disciples' heads, didn't it? You know why? Because I've said this before, we all tend to let things go over our head that we just don't want to accept. Okay? I was doing the interview with Paul Wittenberger yesterday, and he was talking about you know kind of my transition from the pre-trib to the post-trib, and I was talking about how when I first watched After the Tribulation, I was talking about all the things I missed in there. Things that were, I mean, spelled out real clear. But I, I literally missed it. I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. And I know now why. I, I was in denial. In defense mode. You know, I, I didn't want to hear that. You know, that question that I have that you know, none of you all are supposed to be able to answer. You know, when they give an answer... That's good. I don't want to hear that. You know, I'm, I'm trying to hear you stutter and stammer through it. You know, I'm trying to hear you ignore it. You know, and so, you know, sometimes we just don't hear things that are spelled out. And, you know, you, we face the same thing with our kids. You know, they all hear, let's go for ice cream. You know, you can say it as quiet as you can, but you can scream clean your room and nobody hears you. You know, we all know how that goes. And it's the same thing for a pastor, too. You know, it's amazing how many things I'll yell and scream and, you know, pound the pulpit about. And it's like people don't get it. And then people will come and they'll hear all kinds of things. I, I didn't even say that. Or, you know, yeah, okay, I can see how that could be taken that way. But, you know, it doesn't take a lot of, you know, it doesn't take a lot of perception. You know, that's not exactly what I was talking about. But you know what? People hear what they want to hear. And so when Jesus is telling Peter, I'm going to die, that is not what he wanted to hear, and it never registered. A lot of things Jesus told his disciples, it never registered. Not because Jesus spoke in a parable they didn't understand, but because their hearts were hardened. And so they didn't understand a lot of things. And that's the same thing we face when we're giving people the gospel. Maybe when we're you know, sharing doctrine with other people. People have hard hearts. 
And and you husbands and wives, y'all hear that too. You know, if the pastor's preaching to the wives, you know, man, why didn't my wife hear that? I heard it just fine, you know, or vice versa. You know, it's just we hear what we want to hear, we don't hear what we don't want to hear. So I think that's what kind of what was going on with Peter there. He had never accepted that truth. Peter may have thought that Jesus had given up saving his own life. You know, that I think that what was going through Peter's mind. Jesus has given up. These guys are going to kill him. You know, you would think after Peter had seen Jesus calm the sea, you would think even after he saw him knock down that whole army with the word of his mouth, Peter would have been like, he can get out of this if he wants to. But no, it's like, no, he's given up. He's going to die. And you know what? Uh, we'll be next. We'll be the next ones they want to go after. And, you know, he, so he decided, you know what? He, he might give up his own life, but I'm going to save my own. I'm going to save, I'm going to save my life. And so, uh, and of course, we all know whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life shall find it. And I think that's interesting because that's exactly what Jesus did, didn't he? He lost his life. But you know what? He found eternal life for everyone through that. And so, uh, just an interesting thing there. But in verse 20, Jesus answered him, I spake open, or so the high priest, verse 19, then the high priest asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. You know, bringing the disciples in on it again. You know, they're, they're going to try to get his disciples too. So they asked him of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogues and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. And I like that too. I like that too for these preachers that, you know, they're all going, they're criticizing us for putting all our sermons online and being really public about things. They're like password protecting theirs. You know, they're, they're careful what they preach. You know, they make sure it's all behind closed doors. You know, we don't want everybody to know what we're teaching here. You know, we don't want everybody to know what all's going on here. That's not how Jesus did things. Je well, Jesus never used YouTube or anything like that. No, you know what he did? He used the best thing that they had back then. He went into the public places. He went into the synagogues. He went into the temple. He went where there were the largest gatherings. You know, and the synagogue would have been a great place too because of the fact they you know, have scriptures there too that they could open up and look at. And he was as public as all get out. And so here they are, they're questioning Jesus. What is this that you teach? Well, listen, that is not a good way to get to the bottom of what he taught. Because let's just assume that Jesus is an ordinary man like they're thinking. Well, what's he going to do when he's on trial and facing death? He's going to lie, isn't he? So how do you find the truth? How are they supposed to find the truth back in those days? The mouth of two or three witnesses. And, you hear, and, the, and this gospel doesn't tell us about it, but the witnesses would not agree together. They couldn't get any witnesses to agree together. You can't condemn somebody unless it's at the mouth of two or three witnesses and they couldn't do it. But that's what Jesus said to do. Hey, Go ask the people that heard me. Okay, if he would have been, if they'd have had YouTube and all that stuff back then, he just said, "Listen, go on YouTube and listen to the message yourself." You know, here's a CD of the message. You know, go listen to it. Hear my words. Hear what I said. You want to know what I teach? It's out there. And you know what he's saying? You know what you want to know what I teach? It's out there. Just go ask the people. I didn't teach anything in secret. I did it in public places. When I would be out by Galilee, I'd get out on a boat a little ways out so everyone could hear me, and I'd preach to the multitudes. You know, there were multitudes everywhere I'd go. I would preach these things. I went to the most public places that we had, and I preached, and thousands of people heard what I preached. Just ask them what my doctrine was. And so that's the way you do it. You don't ask just that one. You I mean you can ask them if you want, but yeah, they're going to lie. You're not going to get to the bottom of it that way. But even them doing that, you know, and so they did. They try to prep these people. You know, they, there was people they tried to prep them. Hey, say that he said this. Here, you know, twist his words. You know, tell everybody. You know, talk about how he said he was going to destroy the temple. You know, that's something. You know, that's something bad right there. That's something dangerous. Dangerous right there. But even with that, even though Jesus and Jesus didn't say or. Yeah, he did say, he said, I will destroy this temple. Yeah, he said, and, you know, they, th those people couldn't even get that right. 
You know, we all know he meant the temple of his body, but they couldn't even get that right, even though Jesus did say he was going to destroy this temple. But once again, there's a very good reason why they couldn't get any witnesses to agree together. Uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I'll get that in a minute. But look at verse 22. So it says, And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas, the high priest. Okay, So he, remember, he hasn't done anything, but they had sent him bound. Here he is bound. And what is it that he had just told him? Jesus wasn't being a smart aleck when he said, Hey, listen to those who heard me preach. He wasn't being smart. That's what they were supposed to be doing according to their law. They're supposed to be getting witnesses. And it shouldn't have been hard to find witnesses to agree to what Jesus had said because he had said it in front of a lot of people. And so that he's not being smart, but yet here he goes and he goes and he smites him for that. And so, uh, you know, Jesus' suggestion here, I believe it was one, it, it, it went along with their law. Yet he was treated like a lawbreaker for saying it. And so while it was mission, while it was always Jesus' mission to go to the cross, we need to understand this. It was always Jesus' mission to go to the cross. We know that. From the time he was born, you know, it was it was the path was always leading to the cross. Okay, the cross was not plan B, you know, for the Gentiles. The plan was always the cross. You can see that when you just go back in the book, uh, you know, the book of Exodus and read about the Passover. You know, there's no doubt it was always God's plan for Jesus to go to the cross, yet it, he had to get to the cross without violating any laws. Okay. Now that actually makes it challenging because, you know, if I had a goal of, you know, going to prison, that's not a hard thing to accomplish, is it? You know, uh, I could, you know, but what if you said you got to go to figure, figure out a way to go to prison, get locked up in prison without breaking any laws? How am I supposed to do that? But remember, you know, Jesus, he's got to be perfect here. Okay. He's got to be the sinless son of God. So he's got to, he's got to obey all the Old Testament laws, and he's even got to obey you know, their Roman laws and things as long as none of those laws interfered with God's law. So how do you get executed when you're not allowed to break any laws? Well, Jesus did it, didn't he? Jesus did it, and how did he do it? He did it by preaching the truth. Just preaching the truth and making them hate him that much. I mean, and they did. The Jews, they hated him that much just for preaching the truth. And so Jesus did. He went to the, he went to the cross without breaking any laws. And his execution was completely unlawful. So once again, they couldn't even get two witnesses to agree together against him. And yet they still crucified him. So there was, there was no law that you could use in any way to say that, you know, yep, he needed to go to the cross for this. He had to get to that cross without breaking any laws. And sure enough, he did it. That's amazing right there. If you just uh, think about that, you just ponder on that for a little while. And you think about getting to the cross without breaking any laws. And that's what Jesus did. Just an amazing thing about God's plan. And it just, it, you know, just proves he always knew what was going to happen. So, amazing thing when you think about it. So, look at verse 25. It says, And Simon Peter stood and warned himself. And they said therefore unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? And he denied it, and said, I am not one of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, saith, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately the cock crew. So, Peter's third denial, it was immediately followed by that cock crowing. Remember one of the other gospels before the cock crow, tr cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And so, uh, and then, I mean, I, I don't know how close that chicken was to Peter, but you know, it, it had to freak him out a little bit when, as soon as that came out of his mouth for the third time, boom, all of a sudden he hears that cock crow and it had to, and you know, we know that one of the other gospels, you know, he went out and wept bitterly. 
I did exactly what Jesus said I was going to do. And, you know, while they had to make him feel terrible, you know, it had to impress him once again, too, you would think. That, you know, that he nailed that little detail like that. And so, uh, verse 32, um, well, let's go and start reading verse 28. I don't jump to 32 yet. So, verse 28, it says, Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? And they answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Okay, so what does that mean right there? Because it says it's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. And then it mentions in the next verse that that fulfilled a, a prophecy, that fulfilled a saying of Jesus signifying by what death he should die. And the reason for that, what, that, what verse 32 is talking about is Jesus prophesied, uh, I forgot what chapter it was, that he said, I will, if I be lifted up from the earth. And it said, he said that signifying by what death he should die. Jesus prophesied that he would die on a cross, which was not a Jewish method of execution. Where do you see that in the Old Testament? You don't see that. Usually you'd see stoning. And what was it that the Jews usually wanted to do whenever they were ready to kill Jesus? They were usually ready to stone him, weren't they? But no, Jesus prophesied the type of death he was going to die. And it wasn't a Jewish death. It was a Roman death. And so that's why it mentions that prophecy being fulfilled there because that's exactly what happened. Jesus was crucified. He was lifted up from the earth. And so Jesus, he constantly gave prophecies like that you know, when he was talking so there would be no doubt he was who he said he was. So not only was it his mission you know, from the beginning to be executed and he managed to do it without breaking a single law, okay, and once again, it would be like, you know, if one of your kids like, hey, I'm going to do a prophecy. You know, I prophesy mom and dad's going to spank me before the day is over, you know, and then they go throw a rock through the window. OK, well, you know, it would have been impressive if you would have, would have prophesied that you were going to get spanked and you were going to do nothing bad, you know, that day, you know, according to anyone's definition, not just your, not just your own. You know, so Jesus, you know, he did that. But then he also he even prophesied what death he would die once again. This is just this is just showing everyone. Hey, Jesus went to the cross willingly, on purpose. It was something that was prophesied. It was always God's plan. It was it was always what He intended to do. This was not a mistake. This was not an accident. This is it was exactly what God wanted. He's left no doubt after all these prophecies have come to pass. And so, look at verse thirty three. It says, And Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, and called Jesus, and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this of thyself? Or did others tell it, th tell it thee of me? Because Now this is interesting too, because if Jesus would have been saying he was the king of the Jews, well, isn't that cause for concern from the authorities? I mean, that's a reason, to, okay, you know what, this is a reason to worry about this guy. He's calling himself the king when he's not the king. You know, we put Herod as king. It, then they could have accused him of going against Roman authority. And Jesus asked him, you know, where did you get this from? You know, did you hear me say this? Or, you know, did, did others say this about me? It, you, know, where, you know, where did that come from? You know, you can't always help what people are saying about you. You, know, there's this, you can't always control that. Can't always control what people are putting out there about you on social media or anything like that. And you know what? You shouldn't judge somebody based on what others are saying about them, especially their enemies. You know, let's hear what they're saying. And so he's just, you know, where'd you get that from? Then Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priest have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world... Then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. 
but now is my kingdom not from hence. And that's interesting too because he's, you know, he's being delivered by the Jews. And so he's like, you know, are you the king of the Jews? Why would they deliver their own king like that? You know, it's just, you know, it's just kind of an accusation they're throwing at him. But Jesus tells him, you know, my kingdom's not of this world. And so, um, verse 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. So to what end was he born? Was he born to be the king? Or was he born for that end that he was about to face? He was born to die. And that, that, there's a Christmas song we sing. Born to to die. That was why that was why he came the first time. Okay? He is going to come again and it's going to be his king next time. But that was not why he was on earth. He never talked about being king while he was on earth. You know what he did? He preached truth. You know what he did? He preached the gospel. He told people about salvation. He tried to get people to believe him. He testified of the word of God and of the, uh, of the uh, will of the Father. That was what he did. And every, he said, everyone that's of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find no fault in him at all. So I don't, I don't, I don't totally understand if it's like he's just, you know, he hears this. He doesn't know what's going on. He just says, what is truth? And he leaves. I don't know what the truth is, but he goes out and he tells them, I find no fault in him at all. You know? Because there was no fault in him. Once again, 100% innocent. Has done nothing wrong, even to Pilate. This high up, this extremely high ranking individual. Yeah, you haven't done anything wrong. You haven't done anything to deserve to die. You know, we don't need to worry about this guy. He's not trying to start a kingdom on this earth. You know, he's, you know, he probably maybe thought he was some kind of religious nut or something. But, you know, he's harmless. These guys come and go. We don't need to worry about him. But he said, we found no fault in him at all. But he said, but ye have a custom. He said, I got to keep these people happy. That I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. I personally think Pilate, he went and did that thinking they would re- people would demand that Jesus be released. He thought, you know what? All right, this, this, will, this will take care of, you know, this will clean my hands. We see in another gospel afterwards, he's washing his hands. But he's like, yeah, you know what? I'll give him a choice. All right, and we've got Barabbas. He's known for sedition. He, you know, he's a, here it mentions him being a robber. I think it mentions him being a murderer in one of the other gospels. Surely they're going to want this man who has never done anything to be freed over a robber. But what did they do? They chose Barabbas. And so, uh, and you know, in one of the other gospels, you know, Peter or Pilate, he went and he's, he's washed his hand. You know, I'm, I'm clean from the blood of this man. No, he's not. Uh, you know, no, no, he's not. He wasn't clean at all. He, Pilate was just a coward. Okay? That, that's, that's all that guy was. But they cried all again, saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. And I tell while there is no doubt that Jesus is king, that was not why he came to earth the first time. He came to be our substitute on the cross. That was it. Jesus Christ, our substitute. That was why he came. Barab- I, I, when you look at Barabbas, I think there's no doubt who Barabbas pictures. I think Bar- Barabbas pictures us. It, it, he pictures the sinner. That individual, any of us, we could put ourselves in that place right there. Who are we going to release? The king of the Jews or Barabbas or, or Lonnie or Adam or Mark? You know, it, no, we want, you know, we want Barabbas. What? You know, I'll bet it shocked Barabbas to hear that. He knew he was a bad guy. What, are you serious? They picked me. We don't know what ever happened to him after that. I know they made a movie about him where he eventually got saved. And I, I had a guy one time could tell me, I, I'm convinced Barabbas got saved later. 
And I, I said, I said, how do you know that? And he was like, he's like, I watched. Have you seen the movie Barabbas? And I'm like, I, I do remember watching that. It was like an old Anthony Quinn movie from years ago. And I was like, I said, but you realize that was just a movie, don't you? I said, I said the Bible doesn't say. Now, I told him though. I said, I will say this. You know, because I do believe that Barabbas is a picture of us. Something tells me he probably did. I'd like to think that he did, but at the, at the same time, the Bible doesn't tell us that the Bible doesn't tell us that he did. But when we do, when we see that, you ought to see yourself in Barabbas' place and realize that man's taking my place. I'm the one that should be dying on the cross, but he's dying on the cross instead of me. And whenever, and next week we'll be looking at the crucifixion. And when you see Jesus being crucified. When you see him being punished and tortured the way he did, we ought to see ourselves. We ought to see our sin. Jesus Christ was doing that for us. Jesus Christ is our substitute. And thank God we have we had a substitute who tasted death for every man. He 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 tasted it for us. So we won't have to. So we're all going to die one of these days. There's a difference between you know, physical death and spiritual death. When the Bible talks about tasting of death, that's referring to death in hell. And I might, I, I, I'm planning on preaching a message on that here real soon, so I'm not going to go into that now. But uh, when I read John 18, it's so clear from the get-go, hey, this is what it was all about. All this time Jesus has been on earth, all these miracles He's done, all these messages He's preached, all of this... It's all been so he could go and be our substitute. He's taken my place. He's paying for my sin. He's doing all these things for me. And that's who Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ is our substitute. And so with that, let's all stand together.